I, I met Juan in D.C. about three months ago, four months, mm -hmm. about four, four months, months ago. Uh, we are working with the Remembrance Project, and the Remembrance Project uh, is trying to be a voice for families that have lost loved ones from illegal immigrants uh, committing crimes against them and murdering and stuff. And Juan has a very special story that I've asked him uh, to come and to share uh, with all of you uh, here in the law enforcement chaplain course. Uh, because when we're out in the field and we respond, it's very likely that we could come across a family like this. And I wanted you to hear it from his perspective on what he went through and is still going through. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this since we're going into uh, our intervention <coughs> and stress management and communication and stuff in a few minutes. So Juan, uh, please feel free to sh uh, share what's happened with yourself, your family, Christy, and everything else. Okay. Uh, my name is Juan Pina. I'm from Greenfield, California. Uh, my daughter, Christy Supina, she had just turned 14, February 15th, 1990. Uh, she was, last day she was seen alive was January the 4th. They found her January the 8th. I was in Vancouver, Washington. No, I was in uh, Victoria Island. And I woke up out of a dead sleep. I heard somebody call me. At least I thought I did. So I called home, had my wife. She was awake. And I said, what's the matter? She asked me what's the matter. And I says, I thought I heard somebody call me. I said, you know what? Call my kids. I got kids in Arizona. Call all the kids. See if they're all accounted for. I got a few. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm a truck driver, for God's sake. Uh, and uh, they were all accounted for except for Christy. Christy was a straight-A student, top of her gate class. I got stacks of certificates from the city of Salina. She was just all-around girl, daughter. Not just because she was mine, but I got all the proof to back everything I say up. Uh, this person that took her, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Back in 87, he had kidnapped a 14-year-old in Salinas, California. He kidnapped her, raped her, sodomized her, tortured her, but she didn't die. He got put in jail, $50,000 bail, which is 5000 got out. In July, they picked him up in July. He got out that same month, left for Mexico. Came back in September the same year, kidnapped another one, which was just a little worse than the first one. Again, he got put in jail. Again, got let out, went back to Mexico. In 90, that's when he came back, picked up my daughter, and out of the same location, Good neighborhood, good neighborhood, everything. And they found her. She had been strangled, stabbed, raped, sodomized, and he threw her nude body in the artichoke field. And I don't know if you people know the artichoke field. It's black, dirt, clay-type, slick stuff. In February, it was raining. Got her body, threw her out there. So they're cutting artichokes. They come to ar cut artichokes. They're cutting artichokes. This elderly man is going. He's not looking down. There's no reason for him to be looking in a row. Falls on her. Trips on her. He has a major heart attack. The man almost died from, from having a heart attack. Or he planned it on her. I mean, and uh, he survived. He survived. I've talked to the girls, the survivors, and they tell me that they wish 
they had died from what they went through. So when all this happened, they all had an idea who it was already. Because he took them to the artichoke field, both of them. And his toy is a screwdriver. Her stab wounds were from eight to nine inches deep with the screwdriver. Uh, he took off. They didn't get him. Came back, tried to kidnap a little 12-year-old at 7 o'clock in the morning. Some people seen what was going on. They came to rescue. He dropped her. He left. Well, first of all, my daughter, they found chloroform in her, in her system. What this guy do? His parents had a bakery, so they parked the van. Come in from behind her. Knock him out. That was his his thing. My daughter's DNA came back. One, I mean, was it 101 and 365 billion? There ain't nobody but this guy. And from what I heard, the DNA from the other little girls and his are identical. After, and he kept coming back and forth. He was 23 years old at the time. He kept coming back and forth. No telling how many he did that he got away with that we don't know about in Mexico, here, or wherever he was at. He has family in Fresno. He has family in Salinas, Castroville, family all over. And uh, they finally got him after almost 26 years. They picked him up in Mexico for my daughter's murder. So he's been fighting extradition for about a year and a half, almost going on two years. Well, a couple, about three weeks ago, he lost his last appeal. He was in Mexico City at the time, at, in the prison over there in jail. But they brought him three hours from the border, from Arizona, from uh, San Luis, he's in uh, Sonora, some prison in Sonora, three hours from the border. And I talked to the people, immigration and voice in Virginia, and they promised me that he will not be turned loose, no matter what. But Mexico won't charge him with the murder because he didn't commit it over there. And Mexican government saying, well, if he's looking at life without parole, we're not going to send him because that's just injustice for our people. You can, we cannot do that to our own. We took the death penalty off already, as it, you know, to begin with. And now we hear this. And to me, I've been her voice going on 29 years. I, I'm the only one that's been out there for her. I want to thank the Remembrance Organization, Ken, Maria Espinosa, Tim, for giving my daughter a voice. Donald Trump, I met Donald Trump because of my daughter under these circumstances, because of my daughter. I don't know how. Somebody gave him the story of her. He sent people from Houston to interview me. They sent for me. I was in Houston. I met with him. I sat next to him, just talked to him. And uh, he says, he listened, because nobody else would. We, as survivors, we're not victims, we're survivors now. It's a, victims at first, but then afterwards we become survivors. We become a corn, hard. Uh, he gave us the light at the tunnel. And ever since then, since he started his campaign, he's going to do for us. And it's been happening. Nothing's happened all these years. Till this last couple of years, this last year and a half, 
something has happened. I've been to Washington. I've got in Houston. He asked me to speak. Through we were there for the remembrance uh, conference convention, and I was asked to speak. I spoke about my daughter. I come from a sanctuary city, and I spoke against sanctuary cities, against illegals, because we have. I live in a in a town of seventeen thousand. It's a farm community. We got thirty-two unsolved murders. That's a lot for our little town. Our neighbors got thirty-one, uh, and I just want to. I, when I'm out here, I speak for all of us, for all of us, not only the ones that were killed by illegals, but for all the victims, all the victims, for everybody, for everybody. You never know who it's going to be. We might walk out that door. Mm -hmm. That might be our last breath. We might walk out this door. We don't know. And it's changed my life. I, a lot of times I get anger. I get so I called the FBI, told them, you know what, my name's so-and-so, so-and-so killed my daughter, I'm going to wipe them out, family and all. And I hung up, called the Monterey Sheriff's Department, tell them who I am, where my address, and if you come for me, come, you better bring an artillery with you because I'm not going down. I'm, I'm mad right now. I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm beyond mad. Then I called Selena Speedy because they like him too. So I called them all one time. The only one that called me back was the FBI. The following morning, this FBI agent out of San Francisco. Mr. Pena, are you okay? I said, yes, I'm fine. We heard the message on there. And she started talking to me. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. I, I was mad. She said, oh, I understand. I understand. I, but that's not my daughter. That's not my daughter. Because where this man's from, they had found, what, seven, nine heads in a van just a block and a half away, block and a half away from the police department in uh, Monterrey, Nueva León. They're good for cutting your heads off and rolling them down and playing soccer with them. It's a very bad play. Monterrey, Nueva León is really bad. And I've been trying to do the best I can. It's taken a toll on me. It's taken a toll. Here, not even a month ago, I got really, really sick. I ended up in Stanford. My heart was... But I'm here. The guy didn't want me. I'm 71. I'll be 72 here pretty soon. The guy didn't want me yet. He took my card away. Ah, darn it. You're not going to let me in. That's like going to Woodstock. Hey, you're not getting in here, dude. Hey, I want a peace and quiet. Hey, peace, all right. But that's just the way it is. And I'm here for a reason. And when Ken asked me to, if I would, I, I didn't hesitate. I answered him right away. But again, I want to thank the President of the United States for giving us all a voice. I met with Jeff Sessions, what, a couple months ago? Met with Jeff Sessions, talked to him about sanctuary cities, and I talked to him about this and everything. I mean, people are listening that never cared before. We got people with big hearts now. They got families. They got kids. They don't have to be the kids, could be the grandmother, the grandfather, the uncle, the aunt, anybody, any, any of them. Your friend, our friend. And I just want to say that I go to the parents of murder victims. I speak. They ask me to speak sometimes. We release doves. I go and talk to different groups. And it's all because of the Remembrance Project for Maria and people like Ken that are involved and in what they're involved in. And uh, 
I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, if anybody has any questions, ask. Any questions for one? Yes, I, I, uh, I do, I do a lot of, like, I don't memorize what I say. I never know what I'm going to say till I get up there. And that's why a lot of people, you need to be a preacher is what you need to be. <laughs> huh? And, one of our peer and look at where we here we are. I'm here with all these chaplains. Huh? Yes. Yes. One of your emotions. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even imagine, don't want to imagine what, what the journey has been like for you and your, and your family emotionally. But can you walk us a little bit through the, the journey of emotions that you've been through? Okay. First of all, I've had nobody family-wise on my journey. Why? Because I guess they chose not to. Uh, not even the mother. And the mother still lives. It's always been me. Uh, no uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters. Nobody. It's always just been me. I don't know. It just Not that I've invited people to come with me, to do stuff with me, to go on my journeys and stuff. They choose not to. And that is the second hardest part, yeah. not having somebody there. I like to hold hands once in a while, too. Yeah. You know, have somebody there supporting me. Friends like Ken. Those are my, those, that's my family. People like you, because you're listening. I always say, I remember Christy every morning. There's not a day that goes by that I don't remember Christy. Every time I get in that mirror, do my hair. Because I had black hair when it happened. And it just seems like within a month, a month and a half, it just, wow. It got like that. And everybody said, wow, you dyed your hair. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I'm always doing it, yeah. But it, it just happened, and it's people like you all that make me strong, that make me strong, that, you know, give me the will and give me the power. No, I didn't start speaking out till Maria Espinosa from the Remembrance Project got, him, got a hold of me and stuff. The first time I spoke out was, oh, one time at the Parents of Murder Victims in Salinas. I spoke one time. And then when I spoke at the, in uh, uh, Houston, with uh, Donald Trump when he asked me. That was the second time. And then, since then, it's just like the doors have been opening, opening up for me. And uh, I ask, because I, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know, because I've never done this before. I'm just a regular ex-truck driver. That's all I've ever done. I retired. Matter of fact, I'm still driving. But what keeps me going now is a little seven-year-old, Jacob. I got him when he was about three, four days out of the hospital. He's seven years old now. And he's not related. He's not nothing. And they left him at my house. And that was seven years ago. Went to the judge. I just thought maybe they wouldn't let me have him because of my age and this and that. But I'll take a chance on you. And when we go see him, I said, my hat, take my hat off to you. 
And that's my little guy, and that's what keeps me going. Mm. Say, oh, he's replacing your daughter. No, he's not replacing my daughter. He's just giving me the, the will to live, the will to keep going. And uh, that's just what I do, and that's what I'm out here trying to do. And if I can help somebody, huh? From the chaplain point of view, uh, I don't know if you've never seen this before, but um, how do you feel, how, how you felt about God when that happened? You know, I never blamed God, and that's another thing. Like I said, my dad was a preacher. We come good with bad. I never did blame God. I never said, God, why'd you do this to me? I just said, God, why'd you let that guy do it? Why'd you let him do it? I never blamed him for what happened to me or what happened to her. Why did you let him do it? You know, but then after we found out what he was and who he was and what he had, he's been doing it. The devil had him. He's a devil's man, not a God's man. But I never did blame God. I never, the only thing I ever asked for was help me. Because when I would get anger, I would get angry. I still wouldn't accuse, I still wouldn't blame him. I still wouldn't do nothing. It was just something that I wouldn't say nothing and said I would just keep it inside and that was it. So these families that are going through this and have gone through this, when I met Juan three or four months ago, it was at Capitol Health, and we had just launched a new uh, outreach, which is a crisis response line that is a national response line in collaboration with the Counseling Team International with Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod. Uh, and we have an 800 number, 800-222-9691 that we will have immediate local response to family members like Juan uh, in the future moving forward so that people are not by themselves like he was. And I'm just, I'm thrilled and thankful that you were able to come to share this yes. with us. Yes, so am I. And you know, when all this happened, I didn't have counseling. Nobody offered counseling, nobody offered me, he'd come over here, talk to me, come on. nobody ever, nothing, 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 nobody. Matter of fact, it was the opposite. They told me to keep my mouth shut. I kept my mouth shut for 17 years. The county, the district attorneys there, they didn't want me talking about, and I, then I said, why? And then I said, wow, shoot, duh. What, what happened back in 87? They don't want me talking about that because that's putting that, smearing that egg on their face. The second girl wouldn't have went through that. My daughter wouldn't have went through what she went through and the little third girl wouldn't have went through if they would have kept them the first time because it takes a year, two years or whatever to go to court. He should have never, and we're talking kidnapping. We're talking rape, we're talking sodomy, we're talking torture. Right. You, don't, you don't get out in a week, two weeks. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, that's just not right, but it happened twice. So we, like I said, even in Washington, we've been going. Um, last month, he had a month before that, he had a court hearing. And they asked me what happened. I said, well, I don't know. I said, well, they said they called you a week and a half ago. I said, no, they did not call me. So somebody went to file a complaint to the sheriff's department on my behalf to, against the investigator. Well, next thing I know, I get the call from the investigator. He wants to meet me now. I said, whoa, okay, fine. So here she comes to Soledad from Salinas with the assistant district attorney. I said, wow, what's this all about? And then they asked me, start off with, I said, okay. Now, first of all, I want to know if I'm being, am I being taped mm -hmm. or what? 
No, why? I said, well, it don't make no difference because my answer is gonna my answer is gonna be the same either way. And then they said, I said, okay, go for it. And then did they tell you? Did they call you? And I said, no. And they looked at me kind of, but I always tell two people, whoever I talk to. They write it on the wall, on the calendar, or they, I tell them. So I said, well, hold on a minute. I made a phone call. My friend Tony, Tony, did uh, anybody call me? She said, hold on a minute, let me see. No, there's nothing on the calendar. Okay, thank you. I call my other friend. Hey, Art, did anybody? No, nobody either. Okay. Then I turn around and tell the investigator, have you been to Hawaii lately or something? She says, why? I said, it looks like you got a sunburn or something. You're doing the sunburn thing. But she was all embarrassed. I said, hey, I just caught you in a lie. I just got you guys. You're wrong. You didn't call me. So it just kind of like backfired on them. Mm -hmm. So they didn't. What would I? This last time when he got transferred down here, they didn't call me. I called the assistant district attorney and told her. She said, have you called the investigator? I said, no, I'm not calling her. They didn't call me when they knew this happened. They, so I just telling you. That's all. Okay. So just let them know that, hey, nobody's called me. So if they tell you that they did, they didn't. So now you. So that's what I've been going through all this. And that's what upset me more than anything else is them. They're not all bad. They're not all bad. When this first happened, I had the investigators to start off with. They told me, oh, she had alcohol in her system. She had drugs in her system, this and that. When they got done with the autopsy and everything else, she didn't have anything but chloroform in her system. And all this time I said, how could they? She was anti-drug. And I went through a little bit. With this, I mean, it was, this was killing me. It, I think worse than anything. And then come to find out, they had lied to me again. It wasn't true. And so that's what I've been dealing with. So when I come with people like you and stuff, it's uh, a relief. It's, gonna, it changes everything. That was going to be my question. Is, does talking about it, as painful as it may be, Yes. Provide a measure of release or relief from some of the pent up emotions and duress that you've been having. Yes. Yes, it does. It, it, it's a lot off my shoulders. Because I'm sure you all have families. Right, right. Grandkids, mm -hmm. everything. And yes. If Ken would let you, maybe not right now, but some other time, say this in Espanol for the community that believe they should be having the sanctuary city. They need to hear your story in Espanol because there's a lot of us, and me included, thinking what, why is Ken bringing somebody here about this? That was my thought. But to hear you today, compadre, I understand now. And I'm a right. We will go to a house someday that had something happen by somebody that's not from this country and we're going to have to deal with that ministry. We're going to have to deal with the chaplain. Yes. But I truly believe the word Espanol, because more than any, the Spanish speaking are saying they're picking on me. Yes. And they need to hear your story in Spanish. Maybe not today, but sometime we need so to do that. What, what I'd like to do, if you're okay, yes. let's end this now, okay. take a little break, and then we'll have you come back and do it again, but do it in Spanish. No problem. Let us. 